are tonight. Um, again, my name is Christina Papadopoulos. Um, I'm a top engineer here in Chelsea. Um, I'd like to start off just by telling you a little bit about myself uh, before we get into it. Um, I know we have two hours, and I, I do not plan on talking to you for two hours. <laughs> um, so, first of all, um, I have been living in Chelmsford since 2005, uh, since I married my lovely husband. Um, he was living in Chelmsford, and I found Chelmsford to be just a beautiful town, um, and I really embraced it as my own, and so I've been very happy here since 2005. Um, I started off, uh, my interest in pollution started in, back in sixth grade, actually. Um, in class, in, in school, they had this presentation where somebody came in and they spoke about pollution. And it was really my first experience with somebody telling me about pollution, just in general, because it was the 90s, we just talked about pollution. Um, and I thought that was, wow, this is amazing, and this is something that really, uh, it touched me. I care deeply about it, and I wanted to do something with my life that would help protect um, the environment and help reduce pollution. Um, so that stuck, <coughs> whatever that presentation was, don't remember exactly, but it stuck with me enough that um, it carried through the rest of my education. Um, also developed that I was, you know, learned that I was pretty good at math, so I figured, okay, we got this pollution thing, we got math, what can I do with a career? How can I develop this into a career? Um, also, I always wanted to know how things worked. So that was the engineering part of it. I always wanted to you know, take things apart and figure out what makes the tank. So putting all that together, came up with civil engineering. Okay, so I made <coughs> civil engineering at UMass Lowell. Didn't really know what that meant, or what I was gonna do with it. Probably picture myself designing skyscrapers or something. Um, not exactly, that's not exactly how it turned out. <laughs> Um, uh, shortly after graduating from UMass Lowell, I started my career uh, as a consultant. So I did a lot of development, working with developers, um, designing site plans, and building and uh, working on construction. Um, then I learned about um, municipal engineering. And uh, I got a great job in working for the town of Westboro, Massachusetts. And that's where I was introduced to the idea of the MS4 permit. So this permit that EPA is requiring all municipalities to comply with certain rules and regulations and how and I learned what the towns need to do in order to comply. I found that interesting and um, I became the MS4 expert in Westboro. Um, and then in 2013, Chelmsford had an opening. Of course, I was already living in Chelmsford, so I came on over to Chelmsford. So I've been here since 2013. Um, brought my MS4 knowledge with me, and I'm here to talk with you more about stormwater pollution, and um, also a little bit about myself. I'm not just a civil engineer, I'm also a mom. I've got two great little kids, and we're also going to school here in Chelmsford. So together we enjoy swimming and fishing, and in my bio is eating seafood because I love seafood. <laughs> um, so these are all things that are important to me that we keep our waters clean and safe and drinkable and swimmable. We love to swim together as a family. That's important to me. That's important to all of us. So I think that's something we share. And um, anything we can do to help preserve the water and keep it clean um, and help it to be even cleaner than it is, um, I, think, I think that's all great. So that, that's why I'm here. Um, so some topics we're going to cover tonight. Just in general, we're going to talk about well, what is stormwater and why we are talking about it. What pollutants are in our water? So specifically, Chelmsford. Um, I know some of you was here uh, a couple weeks ago talking about the Grand Rapids River watershed, and um, just talking just that's a really big watershed. So I'm going to bring it a little bit closer to home and talk about Chelmsford and our waterways and what specific pollutants we have. Um, I get a little you know sciency. Um, and then I take it out from the science piece and I talk about um, what we can do as residents um, to prevent the pollution. And then I'll talk about different um, programs that the town offers to the residents to help reduce pollution. And um, these are free of charge. So I think these are things to just um, take away from the whole um, the presentation. If you have questions as I'm going along, please just raise your hand and ask the questions. Um, try to keep this as informal as possible. Um, so, 
So is stormwater, where does it go? Okay, so we've got an image there of a uh, storm drain, then we've got polluted water going into the storm drain, and then we go. So my question to you, I have on the next slide four choices of where I want you to vote. Where do you think the water goes? <coughs> Do we think it goes to A, Freeman Lake or Hart Pond? B, the Lowell Field Treatment Plant? C, the nearest water body? Or D, it infiltrates into the ground? Okay. So raise your hand, raise your hand if you think it's A, goes to Freeman Lake or Hart Pond. All right. How about the Lowell Sewer Treatment Plant? Oh, that's interesting. Okay. And the nearest water body? Also good. Very good. And how many people think it infiltrates into the ground? All right. Very good. So, the the most correct answer would be to the nearest water body. The only one of these that would be completely incorrect would be the low sewer treatment. <laughs> so that's interesting. It's, it, is, it has been, um, they've done studies across Massachusetts and across the nation even, and many people still believe that the drains or, and all this, the stormwater goes to the sewer treatment plant and it gets cleaned and then goes away. For some people it's a magical box and makes all the water disappear. Um, so some, so in Chelmsford, we do not have a connected uh, drain and sewer system. So our, most of our water goes to the nearest water body without any treatment whatsoever. And that's something that, you know, if you take away anything from this, take that away and share that knowledge. <laughs> um, so some of, some of our, um, our uh, drain pipes do go to Freeman Lake or Hart Pond. Uh, some of the, our, our storm drains do infiltrate into the ground, but the majority of them just go through drain pipes and go to the nearest water body. As a matter of fact, here, here's a picture of where it goes. So the first one's a storm drain, like we said. The second one's a polluted water. And then the, um, the last one there is the alcohol pipe. Here in Chelmsford, we have 650 of those alcohol pipes. All in your, all in your back there. All 650. So that middle drawing, that middle picture there, with the polluted um, storm drain, so you can see that the water's kind of dirty going into it. So what that's trying to illustrate is that any pollutant that winds up on the ground, whether you can see it or not see it. So we can't always see all the pollution, right? Sometimes it's bacteria. You can't see the bacteria moving. Sometimes it's pesticides. It's all clear. We can't really see that pollution but it's still there. And any time it rains or snows, and that water gets carried across pavement especially, and sometimes even across grass or dirt, it will carry the pollution with it, and it'll go right into the storm drain. Once it hits the storm drain, it is not getting treated before it enters the water body. So whatever that pollution is, it is going to get carried and go into the lakes, the streams, the wetlands, and the, that's why we need to take care of what we put on the ground and try and reduce the amount of pollution we'll put on the ground because it all gets carried downstream. And here's a beautiful picture of our pond with the swans. You have a question? Uh, yes, did you say there are 650 pipes or 650 miles of pipes? Just 650 outflush. That's just the end pipe. That's the final pipe. And now, I live in North Chelmsford. Does our water go to Freeman Lake or to the Merrimack? They go in, uh, ultimately to the Merrimack, but it's a, it goes in, through other various streams. Oh, they, cost, cost. they don't all go to the Merrimack at once. Thank you. So this is a um, picture of Hart Pond. I like to take my kids there. There's a Bruce Freeman rail, rail trail there. Um, to me, it's not just about um, swimming. It's also about enjoying the beauty of nature and enjoying what Chelmsford has to offer. Okay, this is just a beautiful, serene picture. It makes me want to take my kids there, go, go have a picnic, just watch them play around on the playground, watch them play in the sand, go for a walk on the trail. Now imagine the same picture if it was riddled with blooms, if it had trash everywhere, if it had oil spills, all kinds of pollution that we could see. It would make such an unpleasant scene that that's what we're trying to avoid. So part of what I do is um, make sure that the town complies with all of 
the federal regulations for stormwater pollution. In part, um, EPA regulates the discharges, those 650 odd wells like I mentioned. EPA regulates the discharges from those from those outfalls into the waterways that they go into. For us as a town to be allowed to to um, release water into um, a water body, we need permission from EPA, and that's why we needed to file for the MS4 permit. So you need to see MS4 permit over and over again, <laughs> so, so you know what this. Um, so this permit was effective July 1st of 2018. Uh, we had to submit what's called a notice of intent. It was due September 28th. We submitted it, um, and then they sent this letter back uh, saying, okay, you are now authorized to discharge. Yay, so now we have to do all of these things that they require us to do within the permit. Um, I'm not going to get into all the specifics of what, what they're requiring us to do because this is, this is a presentation more for the residents and um, trying to keep it lighter than that. Um, however, there, there are six basic mineral control measures. I'll go over some of them later on in the presentation. Um, and then additional work on top of that needs to be done because of the specific pollutants that we have here in Charles River. For instance, we have the Merrimack River, uh, which uh, the EPA has done testing across many of the, uh, the water bodies. And they have determined that certain water bodies have certain pollutants in them. This is a list of the water bodies that they have tested and the list of the pollutants that they have found in the water bodies. The example is the Merrimack River, which they have tested and found mercury in fish and fecal coliform. They have tested the Concord River and found mercury in fish, fecal coliform, non aquatic, non native aquatic plants, and phosphorus. So what's causing the excessive amounts of phosphorus in the Concord River? I haven't highlighted because it's one of the major pollutants that we have to address here in Chelmsford. Phosphorus is coming from the sky. It's landing on impervious areas like roofs and pavement and driveways and things like that. And it's getting washed into our storm drains. And that's causing an excessive amount of phosphorus. Other things that are causing phosphorus are Fertilizers. So people who use too many fertilizers or just aren't, aren't careful with their fertilizers. Um, excessive amounts of grass clippings. People aren't picking up the grass clippings. These are all things that are adding to the, to the nutrients and the phosphorus. Um, so the um, loves are Freeman Lake. Freeman Lake has, as you, I'm sure you've heard in the summer or very often, it gets uh, closed. Um, unfortunately, it has. Um, that levels of bacteria in the summer. And it's been tested and found to have mercury in fish, non-native aquatic plants, and dissolved oxygen. I have dissolved oxygen highlighted, and the thing that's causing high, um, low levels of dissolved oxygen is that when there are large amounts of leaves or grass clippings, and they wind up in the lake, when leaves and grass clippings decompose, they use oxygen. So now we have large amounts of leaves and grass clippings, and the dissolved oxygen is being used up. Now there is less oxygen for the life forms that are trying to thrive in the ecosystem of the lake. And the tests come back to show that, that there's you know, not enough dissolved oxygen to, to sustain a, a healthy ecosystem. So picking up leaves, picking up grass clippings, these are all things that can help. River Meadow Brook. If you've ever walked along the rail trail and uh, by River Meadow Brook, uh, unfortunately, maybe behind Stop and Shop, you can see a lot of debris and trash. That's unpleasant. I don't like to walk that stretch and look at all the trash. Um, it's also been found to have fecal coliform in non native aquatic plants. Uh, so, Black Brook has been found and tested to have also debris and trash. Macro invertebrate bioassessments. <laughs> Big fancy word for worms and bugs. <laughs> so they've counted the amounts of worms and bugs in, uh, in, the, in the, those, um, those streams, they those at Black Brook, Deep Brook, Stony Brook, and they found them to be at an unhealthy level. Um, there's also sedimentation, which means there's a lot of dirt floating around. It's um, impaired or polluted with solids and uh, E. coli. So there's too much dirt. Maybe that's from 
eroding riverbanks. So things we can do to help stop the eroding riverbanks. Planting more trees along them, keeping them stabilized. Also, excessive dirt lines up in those streams when there's a lot of construction and they're not paying attention to what their piles of dirt are doing. I also mentioned so Deep Brook, Stony Brook, and Harp Pond is impaired for E. coli as well. So E. coli um, is uh, brought, uh, comes, comes forward from excessive amounts of bacteria. And unfortunately, they have found, uh, EPA has done a study and noted that Massachusetts, in Massachusetts, a lot of pet owners are not picking up after their pets and not picking up after your pets. A lot of excessive bacteria in the water bodies. That was the science part. So now we, we, we shine a light on the rubber duckies. So um, Chelter works together with other municipalities that are in the area, as well as a statewide group um, that, that works towards educating the public on stormwater pollution and working towards um, the regulations of the MS4 program. They provided with us with these great rubber duckies, which say, Think Blue, Massachusetts. There is a statewide campaign coming. Um, it's, well, it's already here, but we don't even hear about it because it, it doesn't get enough advertisement. But it's called Think Blue, Massachusetts, and, and it has, it's just a public awareness campaign. Um, so that's one of the things that we are required to do under the MS4 program, is uh, educate the public. Um, for target audiences, we need to reach our residences, businesses, developers, and industrial facilities. So we need to distribute educational material. And Chelter specifically needs to target the topics of grass clippings, pet waste, and leaf collection because of our impairments. I have these rubber duckies. I've told the, um, so I do presentations for the, um, the middle schoolers as well. I teach them about storm water pollution. <laughs> and um, I tell them that if they, if they volunteer to, to sensible a storm drain, I'll get them a rubber ducky. So here's what I just talked about, race right? steps, like strong race. So that's one of the activities, one of the uh, public involvement and participation activities that we offer uh, here in Chelmsford. We have these fabulous uh, strong rate stencils. Um, I'll talk more about them later. Um, and we offer that uh, as an activity to keep the, the public participating and involved. So one of the other things, we, some, of, some of the other things we need to do for the MS4 program is create a stormwater management plan. So basically outlines exactly what we're going to do over the next five years, specifically what the town is going to do to our drain system and our outfalls, as well as testing the outfalls, uh, making sure that there, there are no uh, illegal connections um, from households or other things that are causing pollution in our waterways. Uh, also, once we create the stormwater management plan, I'll be looking to you, to the public, for comments on the plan. And we need to write a new plan every year. Every year you get to comment on it. Um, so we also offer the town-wide cleanup as a participation activity and annual household hazardous waste days. We hope to continue those. And we are currently developing a stormwater master plan that is above and beyond the stormwater management plan. The master plan will do is evaluate all the infrastructure that the town has. Like I said, the 650 outfalls, the 4,500 storm drains, the uh, countless 90 miles, I think, of, of drain pipe. Uh, this goes on. <laughs> Evaluating them, determining uh, what is what is a top priority. What what priorities do we need to set um, for fixing them, for remediating any pollution that's that's um, in in them, that's caused by them, and also. Um, what is the most economical way to do it, right? You don't want to just start fixing things without a plan. So this plan is something we're going to follow and um, will outline exactly the best and most, um, most effective use of, of our money. You can actually read the stuff from the panel. So, this is a picture of 
Oh, let me, let me see. Can anybody guess what this is? Yeah? Okay. Yeah. So what's the river name? What's the name of the river? The Merrimack River, right? So this is a picture of the Merrimack River. Now who here remembers when the Merrimack River was so dirty you did not want to go in it? Not even step foot in it, right? We had raised many times. Yes. It was gross, right? Yeah. My boss tells me stories. He's like, I used to go and the fishing there was catch and release. Always catch and release because and, and heaven forbid if you know we fall into the river because it was it was loaded with pollution. Well, this is a great example of how the, the Clean Water Act has helped clean up a river. Okay, so it used to be very heavily polluted. It's much less polluted now. We're not as scared if we fall into it. So this is a great example of what we can do when we work together and start doing the right thing and stop putting pollution into the waterways. So like I mentioned, EPA has gone through and has tested a lot of our waters, and this is the map that they provided us that shows um, Chelmsford and all those rivers that are the streams that I mentioned earlier are highlighted in red, um, and, um, and they list the different pollution pollutants that are in them. Um, so this is our map that we go by when we're, when we're um, identifying the pollution in, the, in our MS4. So what do we do as a town to help um, comply with the, with the MS4 program? So we're going to create a stormwater master plan, like I said. That plan's going to evaluate our current drainage system and the operation. How are we structured? Do we have the right bylaws in place? What do we need to improve on? What is what's wrong? What um, where do we need to spend more time? Where do we need to spend more energy? Where, where do we need to do more work? Um, and we'll outline the steps that we need to take to improve our system, um, to, to make Chelmsford better, okay? And of course, we want to be economical about it, so cost estimates. We, want, we don't want to do, you know, all the expensive stuff up front, we need to spread it out. Um, and it's going to help maintain, retrofit, or replace our infrastructure so that it can function at its best. We only want what's best for the town, right? That's what we deserve. I'm a resident too. Um, so why do we have the stormwater utility? So as you recall, a couple of years ago, the, the, town, the town meeting, they voted to enact a stormwater utility um, with a, spe a special stormwater division to ensure that uh, the, our storm drains are functioning. And that is providing a consistent funding mechanism to ensure the compliance with the EPA mandate as well as this what comes out of the stormwater master plan. Do you have any questions so far? You talked about the, the mapping of the storm drains and the outfalls. Is that information available to people if they wanted to know where the water goes that goes in the storm drain in front of their house? How do they how do they find that? So if you um, are savvy with a computer and get on the town's website, at the, you know, the top of the town's website, there's something called uh, mapping. And you can look at our town-wide GIS map. Um, our town-wide GIS map, uh, there are many different layers. You can turn on and off. Um, one of them is storm drains. So you can click on the storm drain layer on that map. and. Um, we're always working to make the plan better, the map better. Okay, so it's not 100%, but it's pretty good. And you can see the storm drains on your street. You can follow them along, and it'll show you where the outfall is. It's a triangle that'll show you where it goes. Um, we also have uh, the sewer layer on there. I'm just going to plug that since I've already talked about it. Case you're curious where the sewer goes to. So the sewer layer is on there as well. Uh, a bunch of different layers, wetlands are on there. Um, so it's a very, very useful tool. So, so like I mentioned here at Chelmsford, we have special pollutants that we need to address. 
Um, we call those water quality limited waters, and those are things I listed earlier with all the different pollutants. Um, we especially have E. coli and fecal coliform. So you see the sign, always clean up after your pet, it's the law, subject to fine. <laughs> so we are, we are required to promote a residential program to raise awareness of the detrimental impacts of pet waste. So when you think of pet waste, <laughs> when you think of pet waste, we very often think of it as this non-moving solid thing, and why do I need to pick it up? It's in my yard, it doesn't go anywhere, it doesn't bother anyone, uh, why do I need to pick it up? So, I guess part of what I'm trying to do is remind us all that when it rains, um, all, the, all the bacteria that's in that pet waste does get carried away. We can't see it, but it gets carried with it. Um, so if you, if you see people walking with a dog on the street and they're not picking it up, especially from the pavement, that bacteria is getting washed into the closest storm drain. And unfortunately, that bacteria is also not getting treated and going straight to a water body or a wetland and causing some harm to the poor <laughs> species that were downstream. Yes? I can understand how you can prevent pets, etc. but what are you going to do with the wildlife? They also poop all over the place. Yeah, so I, I, you talk about the waterfowl and geese. Correct. And, yeah. and, and the deer. Yeah. And yeah, well, the coyotes and everything. Yeah. So the, the deer and coyotes, and if, and if it's part of the natural ecosystem, that's one thing. However, what we note is that excessive amounts of geese that fly in, which are invasive species, and they come in and they drop their waste, that is causing a spike of bacteria because it's not part of our ecosystem. Same thing with the, an excessive amount of pet waste. It's not part of our natural ecosystem and causes a spike in bacteria counts. So, um, pet waste has twice as much bacteria as human waste. And that, that just alone is causing a huge spike. Okay. Yeah. Does, does pet waste contain E. coli or does E. coli form as a result of all the other stuff that's in the water and other things coming off the roadways? Yes. I just wanted to comment that 
we were a few years ago a wild boar went through a lettuce field and contaminated it with E. coli and half the country got sick. So all my goodness. Yeah. Things like that. Yeah, absolutely. The boar probably wasn't sick. There's nothing you can put in the manual that covers like that. Like a diatomaceous or to slow down the water and filter it as it goes to a water body. So in certain circumstances, if we know that that, that one strong brand is really causing a problem, we can go in and retrofit it and do things like that. But Tom might be at 4,500 strong brands. It's just a large number. <laughs> so um, so what we do have is we do, we clean out the sumps, you know, that, that empty piece at the bottom of the strong brain that collects the solids. That's the best we can do without coming up hit. Paying a lot of money and putting in expensive treatment. Yeah. But maybe the master plan will come up with some other ideas. Um, so, more on pet waste. Uh, an average dog produces nearly a pound of waste a day. Uh, if left in your yard, it can kill the grass and other plants. Uh, it can make adults and children sick if they come in contact with it. And pet waste and water waste can cause algae to grow, um, making the water turn an unpleasant green color. But it also has nutrients, so it can cause an algae bloom. So it's gross. So we also offer, offer something to the residents, not just, hey, pick it up. It's, hey, if you see people not picking it up, and you feel like, oh, man, they're really, you know, somebody should really do something about that. Well, we do have problems. And we want you to know that you can call the animal control officer, and he is the one who's authorized to enforce the bylaws. It was an outline of what the, um, within a calendar year, your first offense, second offense, and third offense, $50, 75 and 125 Maybe that will persuade somebody who is consistently not picking up their pet waste that is you know, in, your, in your neighborhood, walking up and down the street, maybe that would convince them. Um, so these are, you know, these are just tips to share with your neighbors. Let them know that um, you can have um, the animal control officer's phone numbers up there. You can also look it up if, um, if that's something that you want to do. So we just want you to know that you know, concerned citizens, um, they should be concerned. And it's and that's, if that's all we can do is that if that's our part is to call the animal control officer, report somebody not picking up after their pet, and that's what we do. We also have um, regulations that protect our wetlands. So um, things that are prohibited within 100 feet of a wetland are also within uh, certain bylaws. And our conservation agent is uh, able to enforce those bylaws. So with that stockpiling of any debris within 100 feet of a wetland, that includes lawn clippings, dirt, construction material. Also includes animal waste, manure, and compost. Those are all considered stockpiling and are all not allowed within 100 feet of a wetland. So if you see your neighbor within 100 feet of a wetland dumping their grass clippings or their debris of any kind or their pet waste, get a hold of the conservation agent. <laughs> So the pet waste has a non-criminal disposition fee fine, that's what it's called. So this is just an outline of what a non-criminal uh, disposition fine is. It's a written warning first, and then $100 for the second, and, and 200 for the third, et cetera. And every day constitutes a different violation. So a separate bucks. So that can really add up. So these are all just things we want to make sure you know you got your back. And they're about lots. Lush green lawn. Not my lawn. My lawn is brown. <laughs> I would like a green lawn, but that's that's really not not gonna happen. <laughs> so why why do we have such green lawns? Well, they're probably using a lot of phosphorus in their fertilizers. Um, makes the lawns really green. We also have excess amounts of phosphorus in our water bodies. 
so those two things are going together, right? We've got green grass, fertilizers, phosphorus. I just got an email today about the Roundup weed killer causing cancer. It just popped up in my email today. So I figured I would just mention it. <laughs> like, you know, these things are causing cancer, these things are making everybody sick. Why are we still using them? Um, that aside, uh, there we are, as a town, one of our requirements is to create new bylaws to optimize phosphorus removal. As I mentioned before, phosphorus is linked to impervious areas, like rooftops and, and driveways and parking lots and roads. So reducing pavement, reducing rooftop areas, okay, all of that brings down phosphorus. Street sweeping and leaf drop-off programs. We offer that in town. All of those help reduce the phosphorus. A lot of those leaves are carrying phosphorus with them. They have the nutrients, and they're winding up in the water bodies. People aren't disposing of their leaves properly. So we get extra phosphorus. As I mentioned, we have a brush drop-off coming up. These, this is something that's mentioned in the recycling flyer. So does everybody get a recycling flyer every July? Okay, so I keep my recycling flyer in a very special place, because I refer to it all the time, it's right next to my fridge. Who else keeps it like, in a really important place? I love it, look at it all the time. Yeah, no, just me. <laughs> well, um, I brought extras of the recycling flyer in the back in case you want to reference it. It has a lot of great dates on it has a lot of great free programs. These are all things we're paying for out of our taxes. Let's use them all. You know, my mom does not live in town. She does not get half of the privileges and um, things that we get. So I, I love using all of it. Um, so I'm here to encourage the brush drop off is on May 11th from 9 a.m. to 3 p.m. It, it will be held at Community Tree. So if you have extra brush, instead of throwing it in the wetland or on a street, I encourage you, our uh, Chelsea residents, bring your IDs to um, Community Tree at 163 Blue River Road. Bring your brush and branches up to six inches in diameter and up to eight feet in length. No leaves, brush only. And just bring it there, and they'll take it. Grab your truck. Truck loads. As much sure. as you can do between my I guess I don't know if I don't know what the lines are like, so yeah. Whatever you can bring, bring it, bring it, bring it, bring it. I need to pick One day. One day this year. We get the brush drop off. It's great using. So what else do we have? We also collect grass clippings. So there's a nice big pile of grass clippings. It's also got a whole lot of phosphorus in it. It's got a lot of nutrients. That's mm -hmm. done. It winds up in a lot of it's going to cause an algae bloom. It's going to take up the oxygen, right? It's going to cause all kinds of bad things. These are things we don't even think about. Okay, so we mowed our, our grass and we left some of it in the, in, the, in the street and it rains the next day and we didn't sweep it up, so now those grass clippings are in the strong drain and now that is getting washed down to the nearest water body and causing pollution. So just, the, just simply sweeping up the grass clippings, collecting them. Um, personally, we, well, I don't use fertilizer, but uh, we don't even collect our grass clippings at my house. We just <clears throat> mulch it up and leave it on the grass. Because, as you know, the root of grass has nutrients in it, right? so it's a kind of a natural fertilizer. Hey, you're not going to get you know, the, 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 uh, the golf course look, but um, it'll still be something that helps shade the grass a little bit. Those grass clippings provide some shade. Leave your grass a little bit long so you don't have to cut it as much. Um, these are all things that we can do to um, every day to just help a little bit. Um, so again, these grass, grass clippings. Let's see. I don't want to read too much. Get the idea. So we'll be collecting grass clippings and leaves at the DPW, Nine Alpha Road. Same day as the brush drop off, May 11th, 9 a.m. to 3 p.m. It is no charge to the residents on the town sponsored days. Bring your IDs. 
bring the leaves and grass in barrels or paper bags. We understand paper bags are sometimes hard, but you can bring them in barrels. We'll take that. Um, we have been offering it twice a year. This year, in the fall, we will be doing two collections, one before Thanksgiving, one after Thanksgiving, because it's such a popular program, plus the leaves still sometimes they hang on until after Thanksgiving. So if you want them. So if, um, yeah, you have a question. So you're saying stockpiling is, is not allowed within 100 feet of, of a waterway or swamp. So that means the reverse of that, if you're not within 100 feet of a waterway or a wetland, then you can stockpile it or mulch it in your, on your land. Correct. Okay. Also be cautious of how far you are from the store grain. Because if you're, obviously, if, it, like, if whatever, if the runoff then carries your stockpile into a strong drain, then you're still violating the bylaws. So what are all the landscapers do? More and more landscapers around the house, more than their clippings and plants and other stuff, where does that go? You'd have to ask each one. Maybe they each have a different place to take Okay. Um, 
so you may have heard or may not have heard um, that we have our off rain, rain barrels. Um, so not we per se. The town partners up with the Great American Rain Barrel and they produce these really great, really heavy duty 60 gallon rain barrels produced in Massachusetts. And they're very durable and um, they come in three different colors. Forest green, earth brown, and then tucky gray. I have three of them displayed around town. If you want to see, touch, feel, smell the uh, rain barrels, there. I say smell because they were um, they were used for olive shipping, <laughs> so they smell like olives. They were nice. um, and we have so three locations. One is at the DPW at our Upper Road. We have one in town offices on the main floor by the elevators, and the third one here in the library. Um, I believe it's downstairs. <laughs> so, um, in previous years, we've offered the Rain Girls at $79. This year, it is a new low price of $69. Um, I heard that they didn't like the $79. Some people didn't like the $79 price. We negotiated a lower price. Maybe that'll encourage people to get a second one, or a third one, or get one that hasn't had that one before. In any case, you can. Um, the deadline to order them is coming up soon, April 23rd. You can pick them up, all of, so the town needs to pick them up on one day from the DPW, April 30th, 5 to 7. You just drive up and hop in your car and start collecting your rainwater. Um, so the idea is that it goes under your gutters, so that in case you're not familiar with the concept of a rain barrel, <laughs> they go under your, your gutters and you can buy a diverter to hook it to your gutters to divert the water from your gutters into the rain barrel. You can also, um, they come with the netting on top so mosquitoes don't breed inside your water barrel, your rain barrel. You can unscrew the top, dip the water in can in, and use it to water your garden. It also comes with a spigot that you can hook a hose up to and um, water your garden that way. Everyone who has one is very happy with it. So I encourage you to rain barrel. Now, is rainwater a problem? I mean, is that, I mean, what's, what's the issue with rainwater? Why are we encouraging it? Yes. So anytime we can stop stormwater from running off on pavement, it's a plus. So if we can capture it and use it to water a garden, as opposed to letting it run down the driveway, then that's a plus. Like that's how my house is set up. I have my house, my driveway, and I have a storm drain right at the bottom of my driveway. So all that water is going right into the storm, right into the storm drain. I know not every house is like that. Sometimes you have more grass, more green area, but the general idea is capture the water, don't use you know the drinking water to water your garden. If you can save you can save money by not using drinking water. You can use the water from the sky because that's what it's for. Capture it and use it to water your garden. It's a good question. Any questions on the girls? So, I mean, just what you're saying, rainwater in itself, itself is not an issue, but because it tracks along the street, it picks up whatever's there. And it's the picking up of all the pollutants, right? So, it falls from the sky, we're not so concerned about it, although there is acid rain. Well, you can't stop it. About that. <laughs> Can't stop rainwater. You can't stop rainwater. <laughs> or the sleep like today. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Any, any other questions? But they can't stop the rock salt. They can't stop it. I'll use rock salt. Tell it down on Tuesday if we have a problem. With the, with the rock salt? Yeah. I mean, during winter operations. Yeah, during winter operations. Yeah. Be, drive slow, which is you saying. Drive slow. You wouldn't make. It's, 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 it's hard. It's really hard. Yeah. So, no problem. And, and, and it's, a, it's a liability if something does happen, and, you know. So, we're using salt for now. <laughs> um, so, so, we also offer this storm drain stem line program. We have an example of a storm stem line. Of like, put them down next 
the straw ring. Get a can of spray paint. We provide the stencils, the deep different stencils, and the, and the paint. All we need is volunteers. You go around your neighborhood and psh, spray paint. Okay, first just sweep it off, make sure there's no like <laughs> dark on the ground, okay? And then you give it a couple seconds, let it dry, and make sure it's not gonna drain a rain the next day, because that also doesn't work if it remains nice. And you pick it up, and you go to the next drum ring, and you repeat. So we have, um, I have a lot of specials. Um, I also have a sign-up sheet in the back. Um, I encourage this, it's a great community program um, for any, any age. Um, scouts love to do it. I've had a lot of great success with scouts doing it. Um, church groups like to do it. Families, just as like a family bonding, you know, something that helps the community, um, giving back to the community. If you're looking for a project like that, I'm um, happy to write a letter if you need, um, you know, if you need a letter saying, I have a community for whatever reason, whatever. You know somebody who needs, who needs that. Um, I've done that plenty of times. Um, so that's a great reminder. To dump no waste drains to stream. Right? That's the message. And we learned from this room even, a lot of people still think these storm drains are going to the sewer system or getting treated. So this is a reminder, don't dump your doggy bags in there, don't throw rocks in there, don't throw your paint in there, don't dump your paint. What else do we do in there? We, um, let's see, soap, soap, soap. Um, how about when you're washing your car? How many of you wash the car in the driveway? So, I have a tip. If you move your car onto your grass and then you wash your car, that soapy water will go into the grass before it goes into the storm rain, which is just a little bit better than washing it off in your driveway. So, maybe that's something we can share with other people to move. I do it in my house, I wash my car. And, and my kids help too, and they learn, and, and you know, hopefully pass that on to the next generation. Yeah, we, we can do little things like that, like wash your car on the lawn. <laughs> um, so what else about storm drains? Um, so if you are interested, sign up at the uh, sign-up sheet in the back. I will provide you with a map of, and if people like doing it in their own neighborhood, obviously. So you just tell me what neighborhood you're in. I'll give you a map of pre-approved um, storm drains that you can stencil. Because we don't want your private property, either that's a no-no. Um, and one can, and I'll give you the paint and the, and the stencils. The paint will last between 11, 13 stencils or so. So depending on how many you want to stencil, I'll give you that number of paint pens. Doesn't cost you anything, just your time. And it's a great program. You asked about time. Why clean up? It is the week of April 22nd. So all you have to do is you can go by the DPW um, starting tomorrow, or it starts already. Well, it's already started. Go to the DPW, pick up your yellow bags, and you can walk around your neighborhood, pick up the trash, um, and any other anything else you find along the uh, curb side, the curb of the road, um, throw it in the yellow bag. And on the week that your, on the day that your regular trash gets collected, leave it out with your trash. It's that easy, and it helps beautify the town. Uh, if you have questions on what can or can't go in there or, or anything else, you can call me probably. That's it. Two weeks ago when I came to the presentation, um, the gentleman was talking about rain gardens and how to uh, how to build them, why they're good and all that stuff. So I'm not, I didn't want to include that. If you get here in government, um, so a rain garden is basically instead of a raised garden, it's a sunken garden. So anywhere where you have a low point in your yard, maybe off the side of the road, or maybe in the backyard, you want to dig it up, add some stone in there, maybe add some nice soil, and plant some. 
plants that will, will work well with wet feet, as we say, or um, really wet soil. Um, it will clean the water naturally, as opposed to adding another strong rain and having the water just flow off um, untreated. Uh, rain gardens are a great way to naturally treat the strong water that reduces the, um, the levels of almost all the pollutants that I already listed. I think actually all of them probably. <laughs> so they're, they're a great thing to, um, to install. And um, yes, we do have one here at the library at the, uh, what's the name of the park? Uh, <laughs> it's Greenway. What do you say? It's right outside. <laughs> Um, you can see the rain garden on this side. Any questions? Well, if you're interested in the rain garden, um, I have my business cards in the back as well. If you want any additional information on any of the things that I've mentioned, just email me. I have plenty of information on all this stuff I can send to you. And there's a picture of our pond again, reminding us that um, if we all work together and when the town does the, uh, the through the MS4 program, um, we will remove pollution where it's needed most and hope to have all of our waters swimmable and fishable. That's our that's the goal. I think we can do it. The Merrimack River is one great example of what we can do. And thank you guys. I am open to take any questions. There's my contact information. Um, that's my direct line, my email. I have cards in the back. Um, if you want additional information on any of the things that I talked about. Any questions? That's it. Sometimes, like your water running in the storm drains, even when it hasn't rained for days, is that groundwater in the storm drain system, or are there other connections? That's what we're looking for. So if we do hear what water is running and it hasn't rained, it can be a few different things. One, it can be an illicit connection, an illegal connection. Someone connecting something that shouldn't be there. Uh, the other thing is it could be groundwater. Maybe the pipe is just really old and has some cracks and it's collecting groundwater. We do have some drain uh, that's along the road that is connected into our storm drains. So that is just always collecting the, uh, the groundwater. Um, another thing is it could be connected to a culvert somewhere along the way. So it's actually part of the stream that's running. And it's not really just the, uh, the, the surface water that, that is collecting. So those are all the different things that it could be. And it's up to us to investigate that and find out why is it running? <laughs> and is it clean water? And that's part of that mapping effort. Yeah, so that's all part of we are mapping those things, we're testing those outcomes, and that's all part of the MS4 program. Now, on, on certain streets of the houses have French trains that automatically connect into the Sondra. I mean, that's all two, three, four feet below the below the ground. I mean that you can't stop that. I mean Right, so that's that's um, in that case as long as those connections are only collecting groundwater, then it's fine. But it's when pollution is added to that, or it is collecting pollution from some other source, and that is where we need to stop it. So by testing the outfalls, we then backtrack it, and hopefully can find the source, if, you know, if we do find the, find the source. <laughs> and even like in sump pumps, because I know a lot of chunks are best sump pumps. And that's something that um, if a pollution is found coming into the storm drain, we need to backtrack it and stop it at the source. So some homes that are just collecting groundwater, fine, not a problem. But if we have a who is dumping their, you know, household cleaning product into the, into their sump pump, uh, then that's we're gonna have to stop that. Or soap or paint or any other kind of pollutant. Those are things that are not allowed. But groundwater is groundwater, and we want our basements to be dry. So we're pretty reasonable. These are great questions.
So it's not illegal to have a sump pump draining into the stormwater drain system? As long as it was done with a permit. Okay. As long as it was done with what? With a permit. How about, a, how about a temporary? Um, someone on my street has been pumping water into the storm drain for five months straight. As long every, as it's every just, morning. Okay. As long as it's just groundwater? And it's not causing a nuisance. Okay. I don't know what it Those is. Yeah, yeah that's, a, that's a really good question. Because, yeah, you said just the pipe that's like above ground, right? It's pointing yeah, towards it's, the stronger. I don't know what they're doing, but yeah. it's been running. As long as it's just groundwater. Yeah. We had a very, very wet spring and winter. Very wet. A lot of yeah, thawing and snow. And so it's temporary. It's 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 they're but doing it. They're doing it. They're doing it. They're same thing with the, uh, I'll mention now uh, because we're, we're almost into summer. Summer. Um, pool, uh, pools as well. As long as the pool has been dechlorinated, it can go into a storm drain as well. But it has to be dechlorinated. I think that means it sits without, it sits in the sun for seven days. Uh, it's considered dechlorinated. No, it's what we need about the These are all great. Christina Capitopoulos, Town Engineer, signing off. Thank you so much for coming out tonight.